Marathon. Welcome to the presentation on Community Radio, which hope, which is a look at the legal way that you can do community radio and have your own radio station, get involved in radio, be on the air, without breaking FCC rules, hopefully. Um, hopefully. My name is Micah. I was general manager of WREWFM here in Cleveland, 91.1, on the left hand of the dial for the 2003-2004 school year, essentially. And I'm Jimmy Smith. I'm the current general manager at WREW. Um, WREW, if you aren't aware of it, was founded in 1946, 47, had different call letters then, I don't... W-R-A-R. -R. At 10 watts? Yes, 10 watt AM carrier current station. And so now we're broadcasting 15,000 watts. We have a ridiculously large music collection. We're on 24 hours a day. Seven days a week, we're also broadcast live on the web and uh, have over a hundred people on staff, I think. About a hundred ten or so, I think. But anyhow, in, in doing this, we've managed to collect a bunch of information that we figured we'd share on where community radio is now and what the opportunities people have to get involved in community radio. I don't know what you're doing. There we go. Go to the next slide. Excellent. Yeah, what we're talking about today, just a real quick overview, is we're going to be chatting about what is community radio, what makes it important, why is it valued to the, valuable to the community as a whole, things like that. We're going to go into existing community radio, their structure, their operation, how individuals can get involved in existing community radio outlets. And then the bulk of the presentation will be the process and the important details of actually starting a new community radio station. A very powerful. So if you weren't aware of it already, community radio has a lot of benefits that you don't get in commercial radio. Uh, we hit a couple key points here. WREW right now has three ska shows, I think, and there's none on commercial radio same time we go all the way from ska to metal to show tunes on Sunday afternoon. Folk yeah. and bluegrass and usual indie rock for a college station, all that fun stuff. Didn't used to be usual, but... Um, That's true. Oh yeah, exper strange experimentalism. Um, we, I think we might still have a guy who does some spoken word. I did an opera show for a little while. That was a bad idea, but we had to try. Um, so you get a diversity that you don't find many other places on the dial, both in terms of, con of what type of music is played, but also just the artists that are played. WRW right now, I think we have 70,000 CDs. We have about no, 60,000 CDs ballpark and about 100,000 pieces of vinyl in our music library. So it's quite a range to choose from. And a lot of our programmers also bring down their own music collections. And some of these, some of these folks are pretty hardcore collectors. And so just the diversity that we can put on from that side of things is also pretty impressive. In terms of localism, of course, everything's locally produced. Even our public affairs programming is locally produced. We have guys, you wander around Cleveland with recording devices, try to get some cool stuff said by local important people and things of that nature. I guess we should also mention that we do do a radio show together on Saturday mornings from 11.30 to noon called Saturday Science that deals exactly with this. Um, we cover specifically uh, the intersection really of politics, science, technology, and community daily life kind of stuff. Also localism from the point of view of local bands, uh, getting bands coverage, uh, airtime, getting uh, bringing them down to the station, putting them live on air, covering local events live. Uh, we throw a huge concert at the end of every summer called Studio A-Rama that generally features primarily local bands and then a regional headliner of some type. Uh, radio Community Radio also presents um, a lot of opportunities for people who are interested in radio but aren't interested in becoming a professional DJ. 
I have no desire, I do not view my involvement in community radio at all as a gateway into professional radio, which some college stations are, I'll point out. A lot of college stations do have, you know, push lists like this is what you have to play this song during your show or very regimented. Um, very regimented. There are a number of uh, colleges that have a pre-professional oriented radio program. So the radio station is pretty much part of an academic department as opposed to a student activity. Oh yeah, feel free to interrupt us at any time, by the way. We, we'll just keep talking otherwise. Now you know how much fun that is. So there are two, basically two major areas where radio stations are based out of. They're either based in a college uh, and are part of the college and campus environment and maybe they'll accept community members sort of the way WRUW does, or they're more of a community station. They're public radio stations that aren't necessarily an NPR affiliate that carries local programming or does their own thing. Generally owned by like a non a nonprofit organization formed specifically for the purpose of the radio station things of that nature. And they each sort of have their own focus, I'd say. Uh, college stations generally follow whatever structure is in place at the college, uh, gets funding from the student organizations, might be forced to cover uh, college sporting events, things like that. Colleges exert more or less control over them and or limit more and less community involvement and alumni involvement. Um, WRW is sort of, I think, is a bit of a hybrid and is actually more of a community radio station than a college radio station, simply because we only we get money from the university, but our operations tend to be fairly independent of the university. Community radio, there's like Portland Public Radio, I believe. There's Portland, and, there's uh, a couple other spots, and with the growth of LPFM over the past five years, uh, a number of sort of community-based low-power stations have sprung up in certain key areas. Pennsylvania, I believe, Maryland, Michigan. Anyone here from the from uh, New York State area or uh, New York City area, vaguely? No? Oh. If you're in the area, you're too far that way on the map. Okay, well, li listen to 91.1 in that area. That's uh, WFMU, which is often brought up as the model of sort of a community radio station. They play ridiculous eclectic music. There's one show where the guy only plays recordings that he's found at garage sales. Like, he'll pick up someone's old family tapes, and you get very bizarre, but also very interesting. And it's the type of thing that you can't do on commercial radio. Um, they're 100% listener supported. They may receive a couple of grants, I'm not positive. But. It, I think they do actually, yeah. But uh, it, it's the key difference here between community radio and commercial radio is that while commercial community radio does have to exist with a bottom line, it's, the bottom line isn't driving the programming. It's not sales oriented, it's not. If anyone thinks that payola is gone, you're, you're sadly, sadly mistaken. <laughs> Still, very, very much exists. The new game, if anyone, if no one's followed it, Paola was the was the um, policy of you know a music distributor could pay a radio station to have the song played more. Well, the new game is just buy ad time and have the show have it played that way, and you're required to put a little mini announcement, but it sounds just like you're announcing the song to most people. So you can still pay radio stations to have your song played. You're in London. It's an interesting little scam that will pretty much keep going no matter what they try to do to get rid of it. But anyhow, they, so they all have different structures. WREW, the internal structure is there's an executive staff, which is a mix of students and community members. Community members I'm basically defining as older people, um, a lot of alumni, but also a lot of people who just came and got involved in the radio station independent of having any university affiliation. It's basically a catch-all category for people who are not currently students at the university but are still involved with the radio station there. And so we have we have the executive staff and then there are programmers. Anyone who is interested in getting involved, there's a training program that people get sent through, but once you're done with that, WRW considers you to be a full programmer. Um, most other radio stations have a similar type of policy in place, uh, more or less depending on 
how they feel they have availability for time slots. WRWR policy is take everyone, can't worry about scheduling later, mostly. Um, yeah, we basically do a schedule on a semester by semester basis. And our, our format is really, everyone who's on staff is qualified to apply for a show. And then we review that. Some stations have a more rigid format where they are looking for people to fill specific slots, specific formats, things of that nature. But in general, that's the sort of avenue for community radio, is there some type of organizational meeting of some level, and then some type of random training, generally. Key thing is getting, making sure everyone knows what the FCC policies are and what will get you fined, because the radio station isn't the only one at risk. Individual programmers can get FCC fines as well for breaking rules. And in a lot of situations, the FCC will actually issue the fine both to the on-air DJ and to the radio station. And a lot of these radio stations have a policy where if the radio station gets a fine for something you did, you have to pay for it. So making that's basically what training to be on the radio is. Linda, go. No. No. Thank God. <laughs> OK. Most, FCC, most FCC fines are at least a couple thousand dollars. And they've been going up. Depending yeah. on what the fine is, particularly if you break um, indecency, indecency seems to be the, the hot button issue of the day. Those fines are the, the maximum fine is basically being lifted up to about three hundred thousand dollars per infraction and a cap of three million dollars in the total fine per day. The WRW um, FCC, I'm sorry, these actions. Uh, FCC is actually fairly reasonable about good faith efforts when it comes to fines also. The U.S. Congress, on the other hand, not so much. So when it comes to things like, and I guess we'll, we'll chat about now because I don't remember what the rest of the presentation looks like at all anymore. Um, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> what, um, there's a We're well lot organized of here. paperwork involved in community radio and radio in general. There are transmitter logs, there are, um, you have to get all of your equipment certified and verify it on a regular basis. Um, oh goodness gracious, I just wanted to report there's, there's program logs, there's uh, EAS logs, the emergency alert system, you have to log the tests that you do for that. Issues logs when it comes to political programming or political affairs programming, you need to say what you've talked about sometimes because if there's a political race and you talk to one candidate and not the other, or didn't give the other candidate a chance, technically you're in violation. It's, it's a very shady area that is not really well defined, but they very enforce well anyways. Forced also, I, I'd say it's not. It depends. It depends how big you are, really. If you draw attention to yourself about breaking the rules, they'll enforce it. Otherwise, they probably won't follow the, up. The big thing with the FCC in general, um, when it comes to things that they're not going to get complaints about, right? Indecency things, they'll get, you know, people will send in letters. Let me just quickly finish my statement and I'll get to you. Um, send in letters, but everything else is generally self-enforcement. Um, we, WRW just recently went through a recertification program. The piece of paper that I signed and sent to the FCC was a lot of check boxes that we ran down, checked yes on, and I signed. Now. To be fair, we did check and make sure everything that I checked yes on was legitimate. But things like, do you have a public inspection file? Is your public inspection file up to date? And so the bur burden of making sure all that is in place is on the radio station, not on you know, sending them in lots of documents and paperwork and stuff. I mean, these things uh, can and will be checked by random inspections and inspections prompted by complaints. So naturally, it's in your best interest to keep these sort of things up to date. But unless there's a specific problem that's raised, it probably won't be checked up on. OK, it's if you give time to someone running for elected office, Technically, you're supposed to notify other people running for the same office that this has happened and give, give them, them the opportunity. opportunity to respond, basically. Yeah.
It's it's purely an election issue. It is. It um, used to be. Uh, there used to be an FCC rule for the equal time on issues, and they did. Uh, they tried to bring them back, I believe, uh, under the the first Congress under President Clinton, but a uh, direct mail campaign did a pretty good job of stopping that. So we've talked a little bit about a lot of the issues in doing radio. It's just paperwork, though, when you get down to it. It's not an insubs uh, a, a insurmountable amount that you need to get, go through. Um, and it is possible to get your own radio station started in one way, shape, or form. Isn't this just the in entry slide for Home Punch More? I, I believe so. It seems nice. Ah, yes. Low Power FM is a pretty recent thing. Uh, it was first as pioneers a concept really by the FCC five years ago. This is a carryover actually of many, many years ago there existed what, what was called a Class D broadcasting radio station, which is a small 10 watt radio station generally owned by a non-commercial entity designed for more uh, experimental radio purposes, not professional kind of thing. And then during the whole deregulation of the 1980s, they got rid of that class structure. Any station that existed under that class structure still exists under that class structure, but no new licenses were issued under that class structure. Then more recently in 2000, the FCC floated the LPFM idea and wanted to get a, a sort of a pilot program going to try it out, see how it worked exclusively as a non-commercial broadcast medium and uh, issued some sort of provincial licenses that had the National Association of Broadcasters rather fearful. And so the National Association of Broadcasters went to Congress. Let me interrupt you for a second. If you haven't, um, well, LPFM is low power FM, really low and so lower entry costs. We're talking, when I say low entry costs, it's still $10,000 to get a radio station started. Um, what's the power range? Uh, low power FM is defined as 100 watts or less, so it's it's an improvement over the Class D license structure. Also, um, looser uh, paperwork and filing requirements to make it easier for community groups to get into the radio market um, and start their own things. And for reference, that 100 watt power limit will basically get you a four to six mile broadcast radius. Depending on height depending on height, depending on a number of other factors that affect the wonderful, wonderful, fun world of radio frequency. Um, but that's the general ballpark, uh, small community areas, small cities, things like that. But you wouldn't say hit the entire Cleveland market with a low power FM signal. You'd hit a small portion of it, the downtown area, the west side, something like that. You can see from the background on our lovely presentation where WRW's 15,000 watts gets it. I have no clue how it would scale back when it was 100. And that's not entirely accurate. That's basically a, a technical map. A, there's some variation on that based on terrain factors that weren't accounted for. So don't count that for accuracy. Um, so low power FM basically was a way for community groups to get into the radio market really easily. But what happened then, Jim? Go. Okay, this, this is my rant now against the National Association of Broadcasters, and in many ways also the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, because they really drove this idea as well. They basically uh, shat themselves over low power FM and went to Congress and said, um, hey, these guys could, yeah, interfere with us. Yeah, we'll go with that. Interfere with us in terms of broadcast. So clearly, no LPFM station should be allowed to exist within three channels of any currently existing broadcast station there there was born the third adjacent rule and basically what it is is the, the broadcast frequency is channelized you know you have 91.1 91.3 basically every 200 kilohertz is a new FM channel and the third adjacent rule is that if I have a full broadcast station at 91.1 megahertz no station can exist at 91.3 91.5 91.7 90.2 90.3 90.7 or 90.5. So that's a pretty huge swath of bandwidth that's just cut out. The FCC, of course, complained about this. And uh, yes, we have a Nauticon radio mic now, so we're on Nauticon radio. But uh, the FCC said that's stupid 
and well, they were right. But the Congress, you know, being bought and paid for by the National Association of Broadcasters, passed legislation that enforced this act. So basically, to set up a new LPFM station in any market, you have to find a stretch of bandwidth that is clear for seven adjacent channels. Good luck. Yeah, seriously. Uh, I've searched around Cleveland, no such space exists. Any basically major radio market will have no such space. The FCC then commissioned a study to find out if a station on a third adjacent channel would actually interfere. And the study found that said, no, no chance in hell that it will ever interfere with a station. I'll get to your question in a second. Um, so the FCC then submitted this report to Congress and a few people in Congress have been trying to get the third adjacent rule removed a number of times, a number of pieces of legislation have been floated, but the revocation of the rule has yet to be passed. The current uh, incarnation of it is, uh, I want to say, Localism and Broadcasting Act introduced by Senator John McCain in January. Um, and hopefully that may, may make some progress. We'll see how it goes. Your question? Yes. You're bringing up logic. <laughs> but see, they, they, they were licensed. It, what it, lo, yes, logically, it doesn't make any sense. The, the technical explanation there is that they were licensed in, ex, in existence before the third adjacent rule was written and enforced. So by nature of being pre-existing, they were allowed to remain in existence. Yes, although very few new commercial licenses have been issued in the past five years. Basically, commercial licenses are issued every so often the FCC will have an auction. If it finds a stretch of bandwidth in a particular market, they'll say, hey, we'll have an auction, an auction off this bandwidth. And all the big broadcasters show up, Clear Channel, Infinity, et cetera, et cetera, try to get, try to get their, uh, their bid in there and then, you know, highest bidder wins, which of course blocks out everybody but the big commercial broadcasters. If anyone's been paying any attention to HDTV, this is why the FCC is really, really looking forward to pushing them off of that bandwidth into HDTV so that they can re-auction off that band of the uh, spectrum. Yeah, the, uh, that's a whole other issue. The, the U.S. budget makes that like a bandit on bandwidth auctions. And generally, the consumer loses because it closes down. Suddenly, there's no longer space for community involvement. Remember that most commercial radio stations are working off of you know a computerized jukebox system, essentially, with a limited library, I'd say. Many of them are even driven off of a uh, nationally centered program list. So a lot of commercial radio is just driven by a, a centralized national broadcaster. Okay, we can talk about this for a while too. Indeed. <laughs> so, we've talked briefly about what it need, what you need to transmit. I, I meant drop that ten thousand dollars. Simplest setup that you could possibly have to do a radio station, right? A microphone, CD player, something to mix it, and the transmitter. That's possibly on the tower. First, however many things I said are pretty cheap and commodity type items, transmitters are expensive. The reason that they're expensive is because you have to license them through the, they have to be FCC licensed and you have to get, bring in technical people to ensure that the, you know, you're not infringing on anyone else, that you're not violating any, um, they call it environmental, um, environmental interference which is basically that someone walking near your transmitter won't become sterile instantly. Um, and similar types of issues. And then basically on top of that, the FCC licensing process, really there are sort of two phases to that, is that you get issued a construction permit and you have a certain amount of time to execute that to actually get your structure up and operational. Then before you can make it operational, that you then have to get the actual operating license on top of the after the construction is complete, after the construction license and everything like that. So it's sort of a two-step process there, even 
Now, I don't want to drive anyone away from thinking about getting involved in community radio at one point, even though we basically been saying that it's very, very tough. It's a big project, but it's not impossible, um, particularly if you have pe people who are motivated and interested in getting involved. Now, the fact that the FCC isn't offering low-power FM licenses right now is a whole other issue. Did you talk about that, Jim? Uh, no, it, it basically, they're waiting at the moment until the, they don't want to get into the process of it until a third adjacent rule has gotten rid of. Um, and one of the, a number of the other provisions in the, the current uh, incarnation of getting rid of the third adjacent rule is it would require basically low power community stations to take priority over translator stations, which exist only to rebroadcast a signal from another station. Actually, there's been a giant network developed over the past 10 years of religious translators, basically systems that rebroadcast religious radio. It's one of the interesting things. Uh, Odd rules about translators are that if it's a commercial translator, the translator itself has to be located within the original broadcast range of the central source, so that it's only rebroadcasting and you know extending your coverage area a little bit. For non-commercial translators, and this includes religious organizations, the translator can be located wherever you want, fed from whatever source, satellite, anything like that. So if you have a religious station in San Jose, California, you can get a translator in upstate New York. It doesn't make much sense at all, but it's how it's being used. So you have these giant translator networks of religious broadcasting that are being set up across America just because there are no restrictions on translators right now, just restrictions on the I mean, power there are FM. restrictions, but they're not... They're significantly less than the restrictions on low-power FM. Um, and of course, you know, you'd like your studio to be sound insulated, and you want to have some music or something ridiculous like that. And, you know, every you go to radio conventions and people walk around um, having who has a bigger penis contest about how much power their radio station puts out and or how slick their digital mixing console is, yeah. things of that nature. Yeah. It's a good thing we always win. That's right. <laughs> oh goody. Our favorite topic. This is a whole talk in of itself. <laughs> We're gonna do it in about five minutes, I think. Um First of all, something that we haven't talked about before we even get to what we have on this slide is webcasting is certainly a viable option for a ground phase for a community radio project. And a number of community radios have set up not really as broadcasters, just as webcasters. It's a good gateway into doing, to, into getting a broadcast license later on. So for one thing, you actually can get listeners that way. Um, as more people get broadband at home, for instance, you can, and with sufficient advertising, you can get into people's homes. Um, has much lo lower startup costs. Uh, webcasting through, for instance, Live 365, last time I checked, is like 1200 1300 a year for 50 concurrent users, or you know, you can do it yourself, a lot of people, which a lot of people do. Um, also, there's no regulatory environment. Right? You can say whatever you want, anytime you want, and the only people you're going to piss off are your listeners, and then they stop listening. And, you know, the internet, of course, is not channelized, so you don't have to worry about interference now, from other webcasters and things of that nature. This runs into our very first to topic, which is the DMCA, which everyone here should hate with a blinding passion. If you don't, I hope I can convince you. One of, when it comes to digital media, the DMCA basically says that any digital copy is a perfect copy. That means that my 56K MP3 stream that you can get on WRW.org is a perfect copy of the CD original. And as a result, we have to license it as such. So we pay, so as a non-commercial um, and educational broadcaster, we don't have to pay through the nose for it, but we do have to pay um, a the statutory annual fee, I believe. Yeah, it's a company called Sound Exchange, which administers it and throws money around hypothetically to the artists who deserve it. But by the time by the time you get past their overhead, the cost of simply administering the whole project, if and yeah. the general filtration of the money through the record labels themselves. So that's all the DMCA's fault. You can blame them for perfect digital copies. And which actually put out, if 
anyone remembers when Small Webcasters Act or something along those lines? I Some Webcasting so, yeah. Act was passed and not too, too, too long ago. A whole bunch of internet sort of radio stations went out of existence because they simply couldn't pay it. If you get a community organization together working on something, then you can actu actually have a hope of being able to pay it reasonably a couple hundred dollars a year. It's no, not a huge, huge amount of money. It's one of the places where it's real advantageous to be a nonprofit organization because you get pretty significant discounts. I believe if you're a commercial webcaster, you actually pay per song per listener. Yeah, which obviously requires you record per song every single song you played, which is impossible at WRUW. I talked to some vendors at a convention about what would it take to build a catalog of everything we have. They had no concept of a library our size because they were used to dealing with people who were younger, for one thing, so didn't have the whole back collection that we did, or commercial stations, which, you know, Don't maybe, keep anything for more than two weeks. Slight exaggeration, but you get the idea. Um, now, before I run away and say that you only have to, that there weren't any other costs in terms of music, you do need to pay to license the music on top of the digital perfect copies that you're making all over the place. Um, three major organizations, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, represent artists in the United States and Europe, um, and we pay them licensing fees every year. Even if you're just webcasting, still need to pay them. I mean, this is basically a carryover of broadcast radio stations have been doing this for decades, basically, when the thought of broadcasting music first came up and the license holders threw a hissy fit and the statutory fees were induced that it's way. It's perfect analog copy. Right. Um, not at all modulated or anything. But uh, the basically the whole idea is that that's a carryover then is that you license the music first of all for broadcast and then you license the digital copy on top of that for broadcast radio stations like RUW we're already paying for the music license anyway so we don't have to pay that again we have to then add on the digital copy license for the webcast well too as an educational nonprofit is a couple hundred a year it's it's yeah i believe through all three organizations we maybe pay 700 a year something on that order um, and there are various, it's a whole ridiculous scale that they have in place to set up how you pay, how much money, and... Based on listeners and broadcast power and things like that. Some of them are really sneaky too. CSAC sends you bills for things that you don't need to pay on the hopes that you pay them anyway. CSAC is European uh, artists, I think. I believe so, yes. So, it's do you, have a, do you have a question? Yeah, so okay. when, when you get down to it, it's roughly $1,000 a year just in music costs that are associated with it. Um, the, I mean, obviously, on our show, we do a lot of use pretty much exclusively Creative Commons licensed works because we like, we like putting up archives of our shows and want them to be around forever. And when we use CC mu music, there's no chance of a license holder coming and saying, you have our music online, you can't do that, or something like that. Basically, yeah. We we have uh, a number of organizations that are basically all linked off the Creative Commons webpage that we go to pretty regularly for, in my opinion, a rather good selection of music. And you can build a whole radio station that are on that if you were so desired. Um, we've touched on a lot of the other... The, the U.S. Congress and the FCC sort of have this... I don't know turf battle on a regular basis. The FCC says what is technically a good idea, and then the Congress goes and legislates the exact opposite. Um, we mentioned that with third adjacent rule, but what it... That's basically because whatever is technically a good idea is in opposition to the sales and marketing interests of the National Association of Broadcasters, which represents primarily commercial radio broadcasters. And so they just funnel money to Congress and get whatever they want passed. I'm not self-righteous about this at all, clearly. But let's move on. <laughs> Question.
Want to handle this one, Jim? Yeah, this is an interesting issue. Um, you can license archives on top of the digital rebroadcasting. And actually, the digital rebroadcasting itself, the sound exchange base fee, will cover a certain archive limit. Basically, it's in five hour segments and can't be up for more than a day. Kind of, I don't remember the exact requirements are, but a certain amount of archiving is covered in that. And then you can license additional archiving. Most people do it by flying under the radar and hoping they won't get noticed. Uh, let me let me clarify that just a slightly before you all go and call the license holders on poor WRUW. But um, I didn't say we. I said most people. Oh, good. Um, the uh, the general state of things right now is when the bargain got set up for how much webcasting would cost. The, it was through the CARP process. I don't remember what that stands for anymore. Basically, you have to pay $100,000 to be at the table. Um, so college broadcasters, and we do have an organization that represents us, couldn't begin to afford it. So we kind of like went and talked to NPR and were like, please, here's our issues. Talk to them for us. And so what, which is what happened, basically. And now we've got the restrictions on webcasting, actually. Pretty ridiculous. I'd actually argue that no college station um, follows 100% of them because there are restrictions like how often during an hour can you play a certain artist? How many tracks can you play from a single CD? Um, and it's like one. You can play an artist once an hour. And many, many of these restrictions are just simply unenforceable. You have to have real-time updating of exactly what you're playing on the air right then, which is a great feature. We're working at WREW on implementing it, but we don't have it yet. Um, and It's one of those things that, that's really easy to do if you have a computerized music library that can just funnel this information over to your web stream. But There were options left in the agreement for requiring people who webcast to give information of exactly how many times you played every song, which is, a lot of broadcasters are like, sure, we love that. I mean, think, the main digital, actually, providers that are being discussed here are satellite. Satellite broadcasts are all digital. And they're like, we're using a massive computer anyway. Here's the logs. Um, we, we have 100,000 pieces of vinyl. <laughs> they're not in a computer anywhere. Um, we may have had handwritten notes from 1955, but... Yeah, so what basically what a lot of college stations are doing is we're putting in a good faith effort to comply as much as we possibly can. Um, we're paying you the money that you've asked from us. We're doing our best. Um, and particularly in terms of if it came down to it, if they sent us a cease and desist order and said we don't like what you're doing, it would stop. Um, but, you know, that's the way the world goes. Do -do 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 -do. Indeed. And this slide we actually talked about a whole bunch in the DMCA bullet point in the last slide. I don't think there's too much else we need to cover here. Probably should have reordered those. Oh well. Yeah. All that practice that we did on this presentation. Right, right. We fail. Is anyone not familiar with webcasting at all, or vaguely the technical implications involved? You have to buy, basically, there are two things you have to do. One, you have to get into a computer somehow. Then you have to buy a whole honking lot of bandwidth somewhere. And you can pay people to get, give you that bandwidth somewhere. Like I mentioned Live 365. I know them just because they do a lot of work with a lot of college stations and are really friendly. They're a nice service that basically what they'll do is that you can just send them a single stream of whatever you're broadcasting and they'll replicate that X number of times. Neither of us are employees of Live 365. We just appreciate that the value that they offer to the college radio community. I should pay us. Um, <laughs> what do we have after this, Jim? I think this is the last thing we want to talk about. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we pretty much actually talked already about everything we were going to just in pieces. If you're interested in starting a radio station in your area, I'd highly recommend getting started with a web stream. For one thing, it's a way that you can have your, even from your second volunteer, you have something going. And it's a good way to advertise and bring in your third volunteer and all the way up through your hundredth. Meantime, get the people who are interested together and form a nonprofit. It's really easy and one of the big advantages of being a nonprofit is there's free help everywhere. 
Uh, Case has a free legal clinic. I believe CSU has a free legal clinic and where students are working on legal projects. And a big one is always helping nonprofits form. Additionally, a lot of business schools will, will do stuff as well. They often have sort of nonprofit management programs that will work in conjunction with the law school generally to get these sort of things set up. But the real advantage of Tadekwa nonprofit is the legal shield should problems befall you and your station. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we don't. <laughs> if anyone forgot what was on the last slide, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have a back button, fortunately. A dirty lie. Um, <laughs> Found a nonprofit, get your web stream going, and in the meantime, track down someone who's technical, technically able. You're not going to be able to do it 100% without technical support from someone who knows how to do broadcasts. There are a lot of people, if you're in a major market, there will be people who have the skill set, and maybe they'd be interested in getting involved in a community radio effort and would do donate their time and services. To name specifically a few key resources, most major areas have a local chapter of the Society of Broadcast Engineers, and these are basically uh, grown-up techno geeks who have fun playing around with radio equipment, and they love doing whatever as long as they get to play with radio. Mm -hmm. So they're good, they're, they're, good folks, they're good folks to get in touch with. Uh, they're, they'll probably help you out, things like that. Also, there's a consulting group based out of Philadelphia that exists basically to help community radio stations get sort of, I believe it's Prometheus Radio, I'm not entirely sure about Another that. Another organization that's not paying us. But should be. Um, and, but they, they exist primarily to help community radio stations get started up, get set up, deal with the technical considerations and things like that. Um, let me see, where was I? Ah, the next thing you probably want to do from there is rally the community. There are a lot of people, as I think I mentioned earlier, who benefit from community radio. Local artists, um, local news organizations, people making local news. Um, chances are maybe if you're in a large enough area, your county gives out grants to things that they like to see. Community radio is a great option for that. And there are a lot of Community radio is a great way to bring people together because there's very few people who will say, I hate community radio. They might say, I don't like the programming on Station X, but conceptually they might really like it or really want to get involved in good community radio or whatever you want to call that. Um, even you know, bitter, bitter political adversaries will get together on community radio because it's an outlet for them to share their views and opinions in a disclaimer late in the environment. Um, just for instance, on WRUW, we, we cover the full spectrum of politics, mostly. Uh, we don't have any neoconservative shows on right now, but, um, and all those people, you know, sitting down in a room and you get them talking and all they say is how much, how they like that community radio has given them an outlet for this. Once you get started, it's an easy ball to keep rolling because a lot of people have a lot that they can benefit from as a result. Um, which makes it easier because you can divide up work and divide up the cost of starting up a nonprofit, which is a couple hundred dollars. It's not a huge, huge amount. What else are we talking about, Jim? Once we get, basically, we rally the community, you're going to want to start fundraising efforts, basically. And certainly, this is, it's not expensive in the world of radio, but it's expensive in the world of a personal budget to get a station started. So you kind of want to get, your presence out there, if you have a logo, a brand, things like that, you can start sort of almost a marketing campaign really to, to drive a fund, a fundraiser to get community support for your community station. And similarly, while doing this, you'll be basically advertising a community station while it's in the process of getting set up. Um, I just think, rough off the top of my head numbers, first year and startup costs, call it um, 20000 Ish. The startup costs uh, ten thousand. If you have an all volunteer staff, you probably pay that again in your first year. So you yeah, about twenty thousand. Assuming you have an all volunteer staff, and then with go ongoing operations in the ten thousand neighborhood, depending um, how much you expand, things like that. Yeah, ten to fifteen. Or, or it could be radically cheaper. I mean, for instance, if you're just doing webcasting, you don't won't have to worry about upkeeping on your transmitter, things like that, and your costs will be radically lower. Um, and it's it's a heck of a lot of fun. I have no clue how many people I reach with my show because 
no one called in and gave me money this week. It's telephone week at WRUW when we're asking for money. But good fundraiser. Any questions? <laughs> Do you know this, Jim? Uh, I know it in relation to public access television. I think I think what vaguely I'm guessing now. I think what you what the idea of public access radio would be where the township is the license holder of the radio station, which might be a low power FM or Class D licensed radio station um, that then the township makes available to its residents to work on. That would be I'm guessing. I don't know. That would be consistent with how they run and operate public access television. So I'm, gonna, uh, I'm assuming, again, I'm guessing as well, that they do the there's, same thing. There's for nothing public formal access. at the FCC level for that has defined public access radio in any way. TV has high costs, and yeah. um, the fortunate thing, though, TV has different high costs because chances are you're not going to be broadcasting it. You're going to be say going to the cable company and saying, "I need you to get this feed," which actually, I believe they're legally required to do to carry local programming. So you say, "I'm going to have a feed in this building, take it." So your costs are all equipment and capital costs as opposed to transmitter costs. A lot of actually no, a lot of public access television stations do still broadcast. Really, they fall into the, the sort of broadcast range of television channels, um, and so I mean a lot of them do still broadcast. Really, in the VHF band, sometimes in the UHF band, but they do actually get a TV channel. That's a no broadcast idea. channel. Who knew? In Jersey, they they all public access is on cable, which is where I grew up. In case anyone was curious. Any other questions? And of course, we'll be hanging around immediately following the talk to chat with people, anyone who's interested. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.